Hi, this is David Olavsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Whether you're watching with our friends over at Torah Anytime, or wherever you watch or listen to your podcasts, we, uh, we're always excited to have you along for the experience. And it's an experience. What can I tell you? It's, it, as we always say, it's a show, not a sheer, right? Because we do all kinds of stuff here. Um, that, uh, so those of you who watch my Motsi Shabbos Shiurim on Torah Anytime, those are just Shiurim. That's straightforward. I, I may move from topic to topic because of my ADD, but, but it's basically straightforward. Here, you never know what's going to happen. We have all kinds of different things. Um, I have gotten several requests, even though it is not my area, but since I obviously excel at almost anything that I do in this uh, context. In fact, I have this expression that uh, that my kids make fun of that when they say, oh, wow, that was great, whatever it is. I said, well, you know, I only know one way to do things exceptionally well. <laughs> so uh, we wanted to have some, uh, you know, maybe uh, cooking videos. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I will put it up to a to our producer Israel to manage to make that happen, but uh, but I think that might be a little fun. Maybe I'll uh, I'll show you some of my favorites that just cannot be taught. You know, you have to you have to see them to believe them. Anyway, but we'll see, we'll see. We always do different kind of things. Right now, we're in the middle of a series. Oh, somebody wrote me. I'm I'm not sure exactly what this means, but it says if you like this podcast, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, or share, subscribe, and like, or, or sub, I don't know, one of those, I don't know the exact say but evidently they always say this on podcasts, you know, because somehow when you share a podcast or you like a podcast or you subscribe, so it boosts the numbers and then it's more likely it'll show up for people and then maybe more people will be able to hear about the share. I'm still surprised how many people um, have uh, have uh, don't even know that I do this. You know, they say, "Oh, you 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 have you have a podcast." <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, "Yeah, in my sixth year." Man. Welcome, welcome to uh, welcome to reality, my friend. <laughs> anyway, I'm just sharing that, and uh, we have a sponsorship here, which is a little. Uh, um, Unclear. I'm going to have to probably say shot in this, and I hope I get it right. Thank you, Rabbi Olavsky, to come give chizik to our Chabura in Lakewood, New Jersey this week. We are excitedly looking forward. Now, I spoke three places in, uh, in Lakewood, four places, four places when I was in Lakewood. Only one was a Chabura, and that's, of course, the famous Daf Yomi Shir. Um, and, uh, I actually, it was my second opportunity to go and speak there. And, uh, what can I tell you? It's, uh, it's such a, um, just, a, it's a beautiful Chabur. And, you know, they also have like a, a like a hookup there, a video hookup. They say, cause there are people who've moved away and they still want to be part of the Shia, which I think is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, uh, everybody is, uh, you know, part of something that's, that's, the the best kind of a shear is, as it says, a chabura, where you feel like that you're part of something. You're not just um, you're not just uh, listening to somebody. You know, I, I've I, I've never fully understood the concept of having a shear, where Rebbe just gets up there and speaks for like you know. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour and then leaves and doesn't really take any questions. There's no participation, you know, so you could just really listen to a tape and get the same experience. What, what are you gaining from in this year? I mean, I, obviously I learned the Chavetz Chaim. It was so interactive that at one point uh, the Rosh Hashiva had to make um, alternate days for people to be able to speak because you can't have everybody speaking. And, uh, it was very interactive and engaging, which is what I, I, I saw over there. It's such a beautiful thing to see. In any event, uh, thank you so much. And I guess I should say at this point that, you know, at one point uh, we were going to stop production a second time because we were out of uh, funds for the production. 
Um, well, we have one more sponsor, and then we're out. So uh, if anybody would like to sponsor an ap episode um, in honor or in memory or as a schus for a loved one or for someone that you uh, don't love, uh, even someone you don't like, we're not really picky. We'll take your money. <laughs> Even even someone you despise say uh, this this week's episode is being sponsored for the person who gets on my nerves more than anybody, <laughs> and you know who you are. So uh, I'll do it. I'll say anything. I don't really care, you know. And uh, I, I have to tell you, I just just on a personal level here, you know. It's hard to track all the numbers because we're in so many different places and you don't always know where things are going to. For example, I finally, you know, met for a second time this fellow who I had met years ago. And he says, I learned in a cheder in Lakewood. Uh, oh, at the high school. It's a high school in Lakewood. Now he's in Yeshiva Gadol. So I learned in a high school in Lakewood and nobody has the internet except for my father because he has it at work. So he would download the show and I would copy it over to all of the, you know, the the Bachram's uh, uh, MP3 players so they could all listen to it. And there were hundreds of people in, the, in that yeshiva. And there's a lot of stories like this that I can't really track the numbers. But uh, suffice it to say, it's somewhere between ten and 20,000 people who are listening to the show. And I don't know why um, people don't uh, think, uh, think to advertise, uh, you know, with uh, commercial uh, enterprises, you know. Um, uh, it's... Uh, I, I, for, th for those of you who, who might have a business that you would like to publicize or something, you should know I have a very loyal following. <laughs> and there are certain organizations when they have certain, um, you know, events taking place, they, uh, they sponsor an episode and almost always they sponsor another episode because they said they got such good turnout. So, uh, um, okay, anyway. That's it. And uh, I just wanted to announce this. And this, of course, is brought to you by Heinz, the Heinz Corporation. I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, what can I tell you? Uh, Elon Musk, Tesla, this might be your big chance. Anyway, you know, we could uh, talk all about it. I might have you on the show if you, if you, if you, you think you have something that you'd like to add. <laughs> Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out. Okay, um, we are in the middle of a series. And uh, we are in a series that every so often something uh, tickles my interest. And as I mentioned in the last uh, two uh, episodes, um, when we last left our heroes, yeah, we were taking the Atbash of Pesach. As, uh, as is brought down in the Torah. And that is a, what is apparently merely a mnemonic device. Aleph is tough. Bez is shin. Gimel is resh. And we did Aleph and Bez already. That means the day of Aleph Pesach, which of course this year is Monday night, will be the same night of the week as tough Tishabav. Bays, which is Tuesday night, will be the same uh, day of the week of Shavuos. And uh, we made the connection last time between the beginning of Sir Saimer and, uh, and Shavuos and uh, that, that connection. Uh, and Gimel will be the same as Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, for those of you who may not be aware, Gimel uh, of Pesach comes out on Wednesday night, which means this year... Rosh Hashanah will be Wednesday night, which means it will be a three-day yuntif, even for those of us who live here in Israel. Uh, there's no exception when it comes to Rosh Hashanah because everyone agrees that the messengers could not have reached Chutzlaretz normally until, you know, the 15th, and that's why they had to have two days of Pesach and Sukkot. But even in Yerushalayim, since the Adim, the witnesses would come and testify on Rosh Chodesh, and that's when Rosh Hashanah would be, and you don't know if the witnesses came, and if the witnesses come and say, oh, we saw the moon, and they say, oh, great, now today is Rosh Hashanah, and you were in the middle of the store shopping, you really messed up. Should have been in Shul Davening. Uh, 
So even in Yerushalayim, we have to keep two days Rosh Hashanah. And since that means Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, it goes straight into Shabbos. Israelis are not used to this. In fact, when I first came to Israel, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay or not. And so I wasn't sure whether or not I should keep um, two days Yantif or not. And of course, I did not ask the question because I am by nature a procrastinator. So uh, so what did I do? So I uh, had a three-day uh, Rosh Hashanah. Now, if you have a three-day Rosh Hashanah, that means you're going to have a three-day Sukkot and a three-day Shemini Hatzeres. And so I made a cold calculation, and I said, it's hard living in Israel. You leave all of your family behind, and you have no family. You move to a foreign country where you don't really know the language and the culture. I always used to point out that my grandfather came from Vengrov, Poland to America, never learned English. And when I, uh, and, uh, when I came to Israel, I was like my grandfather, you know, moving here. And of course, his kids had to make it on their own to learn how to become Americans because they had no one to help them. My kids were in a similar situation because they didn't have anybody who could, uh, who could lead them through the situation. So it was hard consideration. Plus, as an English speaker and a cultural American, obviously I felt I could be much more effective in America than I could in Israel, uh, the things that I wanted to do. So I came originally to learn for a few years and then go back actually into Rabbanis. And, um, uh, you know, who knows what opportunities I would have. Plus, living in Israel is hard. You know, getting a job and making a living is hard. The terrorist attacks, uh, the, the, the wars, the missile attacks. I mean, I, I didn't go through any of those things in America, you know. These are, these are all terribly difficult situations. And I said, none of that stands up against two more three-day yuntas. And I decided I'm staying. <laughs> so I never officially asked the Shaila. I called the... Uh, I finally called the Paisik and explained the situation. It was Marsh Erev, Erev uh, Sukkis. And somebody was here. He's like, who calls up at the last minute to ask a shot? I already knew what the answer was. I just wanted to get official confirmation. Because obviously if I say, listen, I plan on staying here. Do I have to keep two days yant if they? The answer is uh, move on may a love, as they say. But uh, okay, it gave this fellow a, a, you know, a wonderful anecdote that he could say over whenever he sees me, designed specifically to make me feel like an idiot. But that's okay. That's how you go to heaven. If, if you got to suffer, let it always be through humiliation. <laughs> anyway, I don't, I don't, I'm sure he doesn't even watch my show, so it's not a problem. But, uh, but that's the case. Yeah, so, uh, so it's got to be a three-day yantif. But what I was trying to do uh, in this little series is to say that if Tisha B'Av comes out on the first day of Pesach, there must be a relationship between those two. And we discussed that last time. And if the second day of Pesach comes out the same time as Shavuos, there must be some connection to it. Makes sense. And so therefore, if the third day comes out as, um, as Rosh Hashanah, there should be some connection between it. Again, I have no source for this. It's my own, uh, my own thinking. And uh, uh, I'll share it with you now, what, what I've thought about this, and try to put it into perspective. What happened on the third day? Yeah, we left Mitzrayim on the first day of Pesach, and we traveled on the second day of Pesach. And on the third day, the Shomrim that Paro sent along with the Jewish people said, okay, that's it, time's up. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu originally went to Paro, he said to him, we want to go three days into the Midbar and serve Hashem, and then we'll come back. Now, some of the Mepharshim say that was just a gambit, and it wasn't really meant to be taken seriously. The Ramban says, no, 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 he was very serious. If at that particular moment, Paro would have said, okay, we would have gone into the Midbar and says the Ramban, as the crow flies, it's a three-day journey from Mitzrayim to Har Sinai. It took us seven weeks for other reasons, but 
we would have gone three days directly to Har Sinai. We would have gotten the Torah. Then we would have come back and finished the next 190 years. So we would have actually been in Mitzrayim for 400 years the way it was originally supposed to be. But uh, Paro didn't agree. And so he says, okay. You know, Moshe says, look, we could do this two ways. We could do it the easy way or we could do it the hard way. You understand? <laughs> so you want to do it the hard way. Fine. So Esther Marcos, boom, 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 until Egypt is decimated. Yeah. The, the, um, the hail destroyed uh, some of the crops, the, the, Locust ate up the rest. I mean, and then, of course, Marcus Bacharis, there wasn't one house where there wasn't somebody dead. And they said, okay, we give up. We give up. You can go. Forget everything I said. You can go. Nonetheless, he sent along Shimrim, Ki'ilu, everything that I went through was just to give you the three days in the desert. <laughs> so at the end of the three days, the Shimrim said, okay, okay. Kids, that's it. Time's up. Time to go home. And we looked at these people and said, you don't get it, do you? <laughs> that was a limited time offer. Yeah, order before midnight tonight, and we'll get an extra set of steak knives. Yeah, that was it. You, you, you lost your chance. And Rashi brings down, and they beat them and chased them away. Well, it took them three days to get to where they were, so it took the messengers three days to get back. And they told Paro, and then Paro gathered all of his troops and went the three-day journey in one day. An exact parallel to what happened with Lavan, where Yaakov was three days' uh, journey from Lavan, and then he journeyed for three days until the children of Lavan went the three days to tell him, and then he went the whole six days in one day. Similar. There's a lot of similarities between the two stories. And, um, uh, and then he encamps, and, uh, and the Jewish people are, don't know how to deal with it. But let's deal with the third day. What happened when we chased those, uh, those messengers away, the, the guards? the guards that came with us out of Mitzrayim, as we're surrounded by the clouds, of, uh, uh, as we're led by the cloud of glory and the pillar of fire, they thought we were going to just turn around and go back after everything that we went through. So this was a significant day. It was the Jewish people taking their fate into their own hands. And maybe I'll explain it this way, as uh, the Ogedal Yahu points out. Mazolus, um, which are usually referred to in English as zodiac signs. The zodiac signs, are, we call them in, in Judaism, mazolus. And the mazolus, in our um, understanding, have certain power. They, they capture the meaning of the, uh, of the month, right? So when you see all those... Mishinichnas Adar Marim Besimcha signs, and you see the fish, that's because the mazel of Adar is dogim, fish, uh, what they call in English Pisces, the fish. And um, uh, in fact, the Gemara says when the lot came out to Adar, um, Haman was happy because he said the mazel is dogim. And just like a, a big fish swallows a small fish, I'll swallow the Jewish people. Yeah. So it has a meaning, obviously. It's not by chance that Tishrei, which has Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Hoshana Rabbah, all the days of judgment, the mazel is Libra, which are the scales of justice. Um, we call them the Moznayim in Hebrew. So there's concept to it. So Sirius um spans three months. Uh, Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan. Only Iyar is completely Sirius 
What's Nissan? Nissan is Aries, or as we call it, the Tle, the sheep. And that was uh, uh, why when we uh, brought the carbon Pesach, the Egyptians who worshipped the sheep, uh, Nisan was the month of the sheep because that's the mazel, was the tle, was Aries, uh, the, the sheep. And, um, and we, um, uh, we, we watched uh, them worshipping it and we take it and we tie it up and we shecht it and we eat it. In fact, Shabbos Agadol, it's a miracle they didn't kill us when we took all their gods and brought it into our house and said, because we're going to shecht it and eat it, and they didn't attack us. Um, there have been a lot of Jews killed uh, over the centuries for deicide. People say we killed their god. You know? As you probably know, this Jewish kid would get beaten up by these non-Jewish kids. He says, what are you beating me up for? He says, because you killed our God. So the kid said, if I could kill your God, imagine what I could do to you. <laughs> but you got to wonder about a God that you can kill. Anyway, so um, uh, so the uh, 14th and the 15th of the month is when the mazel is at its strongest uh, power. That's when the moon is full. And the mazels on the Jewish calendar go by the Lunar month, so it goes by the moon. So, uh, so it's uh, on the fourteenth of the month we shecht their god, and on the fifteenth we eat it. So that was for them, explains the Kliyakar. But what's the power of the Mazel Tle? It's we were like a sheep. Sheep are helpless. Sheep don't take care of themselves. Sheep don't work. Sheep don't do anything, right? They are fragile. Um, if you ever read Far From the Maddening Crowd by Hardy, he describes one of the characters there as a shepherd and how careful you have to be with them. And when a new sheep is born, they have to bring it right away to the fire so that it doesn't freeze to death. You have to make sure it has food. You have to make sure it has water. You have to shear them. Um, you know, if you're not careful with them... Uh, they 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 uh, require a lot of maintenance. And they don't really produce anything for you. Yeah, you take their wool, you take their milk, you eat them, but but they don't do anything for you. They don't they don't work for you. You work for them and you get whatever you get. When we came out of Egypt, we were on the lowest level. We uh we we come to Kriyas Yamsuf and the sea says, why should I save these people? Hem of the Avodah Hem Heim of the Avodah There's no difference between them and the Egyptians. When I drown the Egyptians, I should drown the Jews along with them. That's, that's how, how difficult our spiritual situation was even a week later. So Hashem took us out because uh, he promised to take us out, but not because we deserved it. And then we had to work, and to work like an ox. And that's why uh, ER in English is Taurus the bull. By us, it's called the shore, the ox. Oxen work. They plow. They pull wagons. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know he, he's strong as an ox, or he worked like an ox. Yeah. I never understood the expression, I, I worked like a dog, because I've never really seen dogs do too much, but, um, but it is an expression. Anyway, so, um, uh, so you, you have to work all of ER to now deserve it, and if you do, you come to Sivan, where you uh, stand at Har Sinai, and... Uh, you receive the Torah, and that's Gemini, which is Teumim, the twins, because we and HaKadosh Baruch Hu come together as one, yeah, and we, we join together. Um, Moshe Shapiro used to point out, there are two things that are always drawn wrong. One is uh, a heart. A heart doesn't look like this. 
a heart is like get little things sticking out all over. It's 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 much less um much less romantic looking, yeah, and much more utilitarian. Yeah, so they must have known what a heart looked like. They knew about the internal organs. When we draw a heart like this. At your command, before you, here I stand. My heart is in my hand. Yuck. <laughs> but uh, that's the, uh, that's, that's a heart. So, but we draw it like this. The other thing we draw, draw wrong are the luchos. We very often draw the luchos like this. This is not the luchos. The Gemara is very clear. The luchos were two separate cubes. They weren't attached at all. And we draw them like this. The tablets. Yeah. I explained once, I said, that's that's not the Luchos, that's McDonald's. I think that's why so many Jews ended up going to McDonald's. They thought it was the Luchos on the outside. They're not. You understand? That's uh that's uh that's a big M. But uh but why do we do the Luchos? So he says it's the same thing. The heart and the Luchos, because um say Kosuv aluchais libecha. Your heart is supposed to have Hashem and the Torah carved into it, just like the words of Hashem are carved into the luchas. And the purpose are for the two of them to become one. And that's what a heart represents. It's two different people who join together as one. Gematria, the word ahava, is the same as echad, which is 13. And that's why when we sing at the end of the Seder, Echad mi yodeya, we go up to 13. Because 13 is Echad. Yeah, it's the gematria of Echad. And therefore, when we, when we say, uh, when we say Echad, who knows one, one is 13. That's, that's where I come to. And then everything comes back together. And we keep coming back to the one. And the luchas are all there because it's one. Us and HaKadosh Baruch will become one. Yeah? I'm Yisrael, Hashem, and Torah, Echad. Right? It all comes together. So, here's an interesting idea. The Pesik to the Rav Kahana. I, I uh, asked Ramesh Shapiro about this once on a, on a circus. And... Uh, he said Pshat in this Pesik to the Rav Kahana, and then later he gave a whole shir in the Thursday night shir talking about it. I don't know if I was the inspiration or not, or, but uh, I said there's a stira in Rashi. When he describes Sukkis at the end of Pashat Mishpatim, he says Sukkis is at the end of the year. And when he says it in Pashat Kisisa, it's at the beginning of the year. And uh, I said, I heard B'Shem Reb Chaim Briska that that's because Parshat Mishpatim was before the Egel and Kisisa was after the Egel. And after the Egel, uh, Rosh Hashanah got moved into Tishrei. Before that, it was in Elul. This is what I heard. So Reb Moshe said, I never heard that, but there is a Pesik to the Rav Kahana that says the following. Every month was supposed to have Yom Tovim. And because of the Egel, those three months of the Egel, i.e. Tammuz of and Elul, lost their Yom Tovim and they were all put into Tishrei. So, if you make the Seder, that means Rosh Hashanah should have been in Tammuz. Yom Kippur should have been in Av. And Sukkis should have been in Elul. And only Shmini Atzeres would have been in Tishrei. And it would have been like Shvuas. Shvuas is called Atzeres. Right? The, the Mishnah is referred to as Atzeres. He said, you go from Pesach to Shvuas and you count seven weeks. He said it would have been the same thing with Sukkis. You would have had Sukkis, then you would have counted seven weeks until you came to Shmini Atzeres. And that would have been like Shavuos, just like Shavuos is a celebration of the Torah, so too Shemini Atzeres is a celebration of the Torah, that's why it became Simchas Torah. Right. So that's what he said to me on that Sukkot. Later he gave a shir, and he said, 
what does it mean Rosh Hashanah would have come out in uh, in Tammuz? Right? The world was created on Rosh Hashanah, right? That's why it's the new year. So, you know, there's a famous machlekes between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer when the world was created. Was the world created in Tishrei or in Nisan? It sure seems like we're saying it was created in Tishrei, Hayom Haras Olam. Today is the birth of the of the year, of, of, of the world, you know, and Kohat Chola Mevi Din, it's the beginning, etc. But in fact, we pass on Rabbi Yeshua. The world was created in Nisan. And if that's the case, then um, why do we um, have Rosh Hashanah on the first of Tishrei? It has nothing whatsoever to do with Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Chodesh Nisan should be what we call Rosh Hashanah. So there's a famous run that says the following. Yom Kippur is in a historical context. What happened? Moshe broke the luchos on Shavos of Atamas. He came down with the luchos. He saw we built the eagle, the golden calf. He broke the luchos, broke the tablets, goes back up for another 40 days and nights and gets God to agree not to destroy the Jewish people, but he will not, you know, show him b'soychav. He's not going to stay with us anymore. Um, Moshe takes his ca- his tent and sets it up outside of the machana, outside of the camp, but he calls it the Oel Moed, which later is what we call the Mishkan. And the cloud goes with Moshe, and that's it. The Jews are left, and they don't want to live that way. They want to get it back. So there's a 40-day period where Moshe goes up on Rosh Chodesh Elul and Davins for the next 40 days, and he comes down on the 40th day, which is Yom Kippur, with the second set of luchos to show that a Baruch Hu forgave us. Says the Ran. It, w- it wasn't all the same. Yeah. There was a change that took place. Yeah. Um, there was a, um, Moshe was davening for a whole month and Hashem was sticking to his guns. And on Rosh Hashanah, says the Ran, he finally changed, you know, what a different Ruach and he decided Okay, keep talking. Let me hear what you have to say. And for the next uh, 10 days, Hashem became more and more receptive until the end he gave him the second luchas. And Moshe Rabbeinu came down with an Yom Kippur. So according to the Ran, we don't celebrate Rosh Hashanah because that's when the world was created. It has nothing to do with that. It's when there was a change and things were going back. Now, I want you to think for a second here. If that's true, then really Yom Kippur is what Shavas Batamuz was supposed to be. Right? Because had Moshe Rabbeinu come down with those luchos and we did not build the Egel and we would have gotten those first luchos, that would have been the end of the world as we know it. Yeah? It would have been a new existence, as the Chazal say, Al Tikra Chorus Aluchos El Chorus Aluchos. Don't read that it was carved into the tablets, read that you would have gotten freedom. And he explains freedom from death, freedom from the Yetzirah, freedom from forgetting. I mean, that would have been it. The world would have reached its level of completion. That's a new world. That's when we would celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Just like the Ran says, what we call Rosh Hashanah, we're celebrating because Hashem began to change his mind that finally concluded with Yom Kippur those 10 days. Dear Shu Hashem Behimatsu, seek Hashem when he's close. That would have been the same thing on Shavas Batamas. Shavas Batamas would have been that Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't matter whether it was the anniversary of the creation of the world or not. According to Rabbi Shua, that was a Nisan. But it would have been a new world. It would not be the world that we uh, know about. As the um, tells the Rosh Hashiva says, if, uh, if everybody was blind, you would make a world a particular way. And then if suddenly everybody could see, 
you wouldn't just keep going on with the world. It would become a completely different world. Obviously, food presentation would be a thing. If everyone's blind, there's no point to it. Akiva Ehrlich, who is a nurse in a very sad place. These are children who have had um, neurological damage. They're uh, not functional for all intents and purposes. And uh, it's, he said to me, it's very hard, very hard to look at, look at these kids and, and see what, you know, what happened to them and what they're supposed to be going through. And I looked around and, I, and they're all, the whole place is decorated with these, you know, like little children kind of posters, balloons and, you know, I don't know, little, little pictures and things. And I said, well, then what's the purpose of the posters? He says, it's for the staff. Because, you know, you, you need something to be able to keep going. Yeah. Just to, just to give you the strength to keep going. So if all those kids suddenly woke up, it would be a different world. And that's what it means. When Mashiach comes, it'll be a different world. If we would have gotten those first luchos, the world that we know would not be that world anymore. It would be a completely different world. We lost those luchos. That's why the al Shachakodesh says that it's called uh, Shavuos. Because all we can celebrate is the weeks of preparation. We never got that Torah. The, the luchos we were supposed to get on Shavuos got broken. But that would have been Rosh Hashanah. It would have been a new existence. There was a process of us going from being sheep to working like an ox and being able to come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The first day, the second day, Moshe Benu was taking us along. We were doing what we were doing. On the third day, when we fought the Shemrim, and we chased them away, we stood up and said, now we are going to do something for ourselves. We're not just going to be sheep. We're going we're gonna to stand up and be men. All right? It says, when we came out of Mitzrayim, we were like, begoy me care of goy, like a newborn baby being pulled out of the womb. We stood at Harsinai in order to get married, you have to be an adult. And becoming an adult is a process. Some people never become adults. They stay kids forever. But the process of growing up and maturing and becoming an adult, that's something that we have to strive to be able to accomplish. That started on the third day of Pesach. And when that started, that's the same night that Rosh Hashanah comes out. Because on Rosh Hashanah, everybody has to stand before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and be judged as a person. Every person at Kodesh Baruch has to pick you up and look at you and say, do you deserve to exist? I have to make a decision. That's the Yom Adin. Kol boy olam. Every single person, one by one, stands up. And that's the moment. And I believe that the third day of Pesach is that beginning of the process of us learning how to stand up and to become a person. Okay, and that brings us to the question and answer uh, portion of the program. By Anonymous, my wife wants to know why should she want Mashiach to come? Hilchas Nida is going to be harder for the ladies. Okay, um, I, I have, first of all, a problem with the... Uh, Underlying question. It's not going to be harder for the ladies. It's going to be harder for the men. Because the ladies, uh, their need will be the same now. It could very well be that we'll go back to the Deraisa Dika Nida, which in the uh, Torah, a woman sees Dam. She's Tame for the next seven days. And then she does a hefsek tara, she goes to the mikvah, and it's done. It's all over. She doesn't have to count the shivanakim. Shivanakim is only for a zava. 
The only thing is that today we don't know the difference of what's Dam Nida and what's Dam Zava, and we might have trouble keeping the count, etc. Could very well be when Mashiach comes back, we'll go back to the good old days and you'll only have to keep a week of Nida instead of, uh, you know, 12 to, to 14 days. So I'm not sure what you mean. It'll be harder. It'll be harder for the men because we'll be keeping the laws of Tum and Tara, and therefore wherever uh, Nida sits, and whatever she lies on, and whatever she walks on, and whatever she touches becomes tummy. So uh, I thought about this, you know, because I have eight daughters, you know, and my wife. It's nine women walking around my house. And I'm thinking to myself, in the time of Mashiach, I don't know who's who and what's what. I, I couldn't sit on a couch. I couldn't, you know. Luckily, uh, I have... Uh, you know, I would buy myself a stone cup for my coffee, you know what I mean? And say, don't touch Abba's coffee. It's easy anyway, because I use Folgers and everybody else drinks Taste's Choice over here. So, you know, I have my coffee, uh, that, you know, fine. Otherwise, you know, don't touch my stuff. But, uh, you know, yeah, when she goes to the mikvah, she takes the couch with her. You have to drive the car in, you know, and... <laughs> Into the into the mikvah, um, uh, the dining room chairs, you know, all her clothes, the linens, you know what I mean? Yeah, you got to bring everything in. Yeah, so it's more of a hassle for a man, for a woman, you know. Uh, I don't know that it becomes any more difficult for her than it already is. If anything, it might become easier. But um, uh, but that to me is uh, is not really the main question. Uh, the big question is, I don't want to win the Powerball. Because if I win the Powerball and I get $2 billion, you know how much taxes I'm going to have to pay? Whew, I'm so lucky I lost. If I won that Powerball, wow, look how much money the taxes would take. Yeah, but look how much you'd have left. I don't know how anybody can look at the world today where you see... Crowds chanting, kill the Jews, gas the Jews, where you see Jews getting attacked and beaten up and, 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 and killed throughout the world, where we don't have a base of Mikdash, where the whole world is an absolute wreck, and you say, well... I wouldn't want Mashiach to come because then I'll have to keep the laws of Tum and Tara. I'd rather take my chances with Hamas and their supporters. I'm having a little trouble with that. <laughs> Which means in the grand scheme of things, keep your perspective. It says when Mashiach comes, hundreds of Goyim are going to come to every Jew and say, I'll be your Eved, just teach me Torah. Yeah. I know that that sounds like a bad thing. You, have, you know, have hundreds of avodim to take care of all your stuff for you. I know, but if I sit on the couch, it comes to me. Oh, no, then forget about that. Let's have a situation where Tom Shabbos has to go around and collect food for people because they can't have food to eat for Shabbos. That's better. That's a much better situation, you know. Yeah, that's the kind of world I want to live in. Oh, you know, uh, my sister-in-law, Shelly Olowski, Oliver Shalom, just passed away. And, uh, you know, from Yen Machla. So I'd much rather have people die of diseases than have to have some kind of inconvenience in my life. You know, listen, you know, death comes to everybody, so goodbye. You know, I have no cures, no way I can help them. That's okay. You know, God is being disgraced. His name is being, you know, cursed and blasphemed all over the world. Yeah, but at least I I don't have to worry about uh, taking my clothes to the mikveh afterwards. I I'm having a lot of trouble wrapping my head around this question. Uh, I can only hope that you misunderstood what your wife was trying to say, because men very often do that. <laughs> okay, and our next question comes from a popular uh, listener by anonymous. What is your favorite Pesach food? I'm so glad you asked this question because. This is one of the things I was thinking of about having a cooking show, and maybe we'll do it beforehand. Um, I, uh, I eat gebrachs. I eat gebrachs. That's, uh, I think, my family's minag. <laughs> Certainly my parents did. Uh, 
But okay, you know, we grew up in Long Island and we used to buy Streitz matzahs, you know. We heard Vivarin Solovich used to sleep in the factory, you know. They were very kosher, Streitz matzahs, you know. And I get married, my father-in-law says to me, Streitz matzahs? Only 18-minute matzahs. Okay, so I got 18-minute matzahs. By the way, you know that once you change from regular matzahs, that means half the products in America you can't eat because it has matzah meal in it, you know. But fine, 18 minute matzahs. I came to Israel, they said, 18 minute matzahs? I wouldn't give that to an Arab. It's only shmur matzah. Fine. I ate shmur matzah all the time. And then people said, you buy any shmur matzah? Only chabura matzah. <laughs> so, uh, fine. But I ain't doing gabrox. <laughs> I'm not giving up good products. I mean, like, there's a limit. You know, at some point, you just have to say, this just isn't worth it anymore. <laughs> That's me. That's me. What can I tell you? So my favorite Pesach food, undoubtedly, is a matzah brai. Now, let me explain to you the difference between matzah brai and scrambled eggs. Okay, I know people, some of them are related to me through marriage, who say they're making a matzah brai, and they're not. They're taking eggs and matzah, and they stir it up in a frying pan. Ki'ilu, it's a matzah brai. That's not a matzah brai. That's scrambled matzah and eggs, yeah? A matzah brai, my father taught me how to make it, and, uh, and uh, you have to be careful, you yeah? know? You have to be careful. Kids, don't try this at home. Um, there's different proportions, yeah? Some do... Two matzahs to four eggs. Some do um, two and a half matzahs to four eggs. Some people do one and a half matzahs to four eggs. So it's, I guess it depends really how eggy you want it. Yeah. Um, he would crumble up the matzahs into a strainer and pour hot water from the uh, from the hot water uh, heater. A special one for pouring. You know, even when we got in an urn, we kept the little one to be able to pour the hot water on the uh, on the matzah, and you let it let it dry, and then you put it into the egg mixture, mix it up, add salt. How much salt? I don't know. How much salt did you want? You know, the the salt's a tricky thing. You know, and uh, you add salt. You stir it up. And then take a frying pan. You got to make sure you have the right size frying pan. If it's too wide, the whole thing will spread out and it'll be nothing. If it's too uh, small, then it becomes too thick and the inside doesn't get cooked. Get the right size frying pan for your amount. And that's why if you have a small frying pan, then definitely go with the uh, one and a half matzahs to uh, three or four eggs. Yeah, do it that way. And you mix it up. You add some oil to it. Make sure it's hot. The biggest mistake people make is it's not hot. And then they, uh, uh, the thing goes into the pan. It doesn't, it doesn't cook right away. It gets stuck to the bottom to make sure it's really hot. You pour it in and you spread it out. And then you put foil on top of it. If you have a frying pan with a cover, and then I'm not even talking to you. But uh, you either put fry for that. I actually have a Corel plate uh from our Karel Pesach set. We only have, we had bought a set for four when we first got married. So we, it's not very practical, but it perfectly fits on top of my frying pan. And I put it on there and I wait. I wait. Uh, how long? A lot depends on on, uh, on your stove, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say give it about three minutes. And then I take off the top and the bottom should be more or less cooked and the top should begin begin to beginning you shake the pan a little bit to make sure it's not stuck if it is stuck then you have to take a spatula and loosen it around now uh, my father Alva Shalom would give it a little spin flip it and 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 catch it in midair into the pan and then you cook the other side for a, a minute minute and a half and then you slide it right out it's terrific. If you're a coward, so you take it and slip it onto that Corel plate that you have, and then you turn it back in and make sure that you don't you have to do it in one fluid motion. Otherwise, some of it will drip in and yeah, turn it over and get it cooked. And that's it. How do you eat it? There's two, uh, there's two different ways to eat it, uh, sweet or savory, meaning you could just 
put salt on it and eat it that way, which is very good. Or you could eat it like a pancake. And you could put pancake syrup on it. You could put uh, sugar on it. And uh, different men hug him. Different men hug him. So, uh, so that to me is for sure my favorite Pesach food. And in fact, I think it finally healed. But, you know, I had put a lot of oil in the pan, more than I really should have. And I flipped it successfully. And when it fell, the hot oil splattered all over my arm. I got this big burn. It slowed me down, but it didn't stop me. I had two more matzo bars I had to make because we had a lot of people over. Now, obviously, that's supposed to, the way my minute is to make it at Gibrachs. And uh, like I say, uh, you know, that's probably my favorite Pesach food. Now, my good friend Moshe David, who is on a number of my online shiurim and, uh, in fact, in fact, came to Project Inspire Convention so we could spend Shabbos together. Um, he, uh, he insists that even though he's Hasidish, that you can mix the matzah with eggs and it doesn't become gemrachs. And he has a egg and matzah, matzah brai. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not my masora uh, to make it that way. You have to pour the hot water on top of it. But, uh, but he says it comes out very good. So, you know, anybody who wants, and I'm sure you could leave a comment and he'll be happy to answer you what his particular method is. Okay, and the next question is by TM. If the reason we have to go through Nisyonos in this world is so that our schar in the next world should not feel like matnas chinam, getting a gift for free, then why couldn't Hashem give us the schar in Olam Haba while creating for us the pleasure as if we worked to get it? Can't Hashem do everything? There's an Adam Gadol who I heard address this question a number of times. Um, because when he gets asked this question, he says the reason we're in this world is to earn our uh, schar olam haba, because otherwise it'll be nahamad um, dekisufa, the bread of embarrassment, because we didn't earn it and we were just handed to it. And then he would ask this question. He would say, but couldn't Hashem just put us into Olam Haba and have us give the pleasure already? And he says, I guess ultimately we'll never know the answer. So that's very problematic because the Zaya Kaddish is answering the question. Mistama, they also understood this question too. So I heard a recording once of Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg where he gives an answer and... Uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful answer, if you think about it. What is the greatest pleasure? Go to Olam Haba and get the greatest pleasure. So we think of pleasures in terms of physical pleasures. A steak dinner, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a heated swimming pool, you know, cold drink, those kind of things. The pleasure of Olam Haba and the Masil Sharm speaks this out. The pleasure of Olam Haba is being close with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And every relationship you have to work at. And if a relationship is wished on you and not by your choosing, you don't enjoy it. Um, the uh, classic example is everybody knows. Parents love children much more than children love parents. And in fact, Rashi says that if your father is breaking into your house to steal, even though there's a din that a person who's in a tunnel leading into your house, you can kill him because if he's that determined to rob you, he'll kill you too. Not if it's your father. But if it's your son, you can kill him because he'll kill you. Yeah. And uh, uh, what's the reason for this? And when I ask this to audiences of all stripes all around the world, I say, who loves parent, people more? Parents loving children or children loving parents? Everybody says parents love children. Why? Because they chose that relationship. Every kid can always say, I didn't ask to be born. The parents made a choice to bring these people into this world. The children didn't choose the relationship. 
So if the greatest thing is going to be a relationship with a Kaddish Baruch Hu, then, um, then if you don't work on that relationship, you don't have a real relationship. It's not real. And then he says, Vim Tamik Odbe in Yantira. If you go a little deeper, you'll realize that the greatest pleasure is not having a relationship with Hashem, it's being Hashem. To be so dovak Bahakarish Baruchu that you are Ki'ilu, Ki'ilu Hakarish Baruchu. You are on that level. I'm not relating to you. I am, like we said by the Luchos, the the Ta'umim, the twins, the two attached. That become one. Yeah? That's the ideal. The ideal is to be so close that your mom is attached. There's no way to get that without earning it. Because the thing about a Kodesh Baruch Hu is he's independent. He uh, is unlimited. He makes choices because he wants to. If a Kaddish Baruch Hu doesn't allow us to make any choices, then we're the least like a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We're just an animal. Okay, so listen to what the assumption is. Create me, put me in Olam Haba, and fool me into thinking I'm having the greatest pleasure, and I'm really not. So what's the point to that? I don't even have to make people, just make a computer program. Push a button and it goes, happy, happy, happy. Happy, happy, happy. It's not experiencing anything. God's not giving you the greatest pleasure. He's tricking you into thinking you got the greatest pleasure. That's cruel. Why would he do that? What's the point? What's the point of making anybody? But if I can create a person who is independent and he can learn how to grow and become like HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you can do this on your own and then relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not like a computer program or an animal or a child, but like a marriage, two equals together, that's the purpose of life. There's no purpose to fooling people into thinking they're getting the greatest pleasure. They're not. I hypnotize you and, and you, you think that, you know, you're married and you have a happy marriage and you've got kids and you've got a job and the whole thing is nothing. You're nothing. You're nothing. That's just sick. What's the point of that? This is a meaningless life. In order to have a meaningful life, he wants you to get the pleasure for real, not to trick you into it. Okay. So that's it for this episode. If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my online uh, website, reverialofsky.com. You can leave a comment. You can listen to other shiurim. You can read articles. You can join one of my online shiurim, uh, which of course is the Daf Yomi and the um, the uh, uh, the Masil Susharim for women Monday night, the Tefillah Shir uh, Sunday night in Israel, Sunday afternoon in America. And... Um, uh, I used to do another Masil Susharim on Sunday, but we finished the book, and uh, um, I've had some requests to start another shear. So if there's a topic that people think they might want to sign up for to be able to hear a uh, shear, and you, you're going to come on a regular basis, I'm definitely open to suggestions when that might be. And uh, you can sponsor an episode. Like I mentioned, we're out of sponsorships, so... We're calling upon our uh, listenership to please help us to keep this show going. Uh, a lot of people get a lot of chizik out of it, and um, corporate sponsors welcome. And uh, you can sponsor a question and answer. You can question a sponsor a five minute parsha. That's it for this week. I'm David Olavsky, and this has been the Rabbi Olavsky Show. It's the Rabbi Olavsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. The Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode. And we don't have to rhyme. No, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. On RabbiOrlovsky.com. Torah, anytime. YouTube and more. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. 
Cora and Sim, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Till next time, till we meet again. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show.